Brother Steve always, we, we're talking about, uh, we could go through these characteristics of love, agape love, and could take one at a time, you know, and, and do 15 of them, 15 messages. And Brother Steve said, there's nothing wrong with just trying to just take it, because you know how he's always razzing me about trying to cover too much ground. The, you could just go, just, you know, nothing wrong with just going slow, but I've got the perfect answer. I am getting old. I don't have that much time. So I've got to get on with it. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're not supposed to amen, Daniel. Quit. <laughs> he's just trying to rub in the old. I know what he's doing. Yeah, that's true. 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. We're not, just find your spot there. We're, we're narrowing in on verse 4 through 7 uh, presently. This morning we started looking at it, and it's all about the importance of love. And we tried to come up with some definition of love. We saw that there were four particular words uh, in Greek language. And we emphasize that particular Greek word, agape, which is the word that's used, charity, is agape in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we explain that that love is not a sensual love, a social love, but a special love and a spiritual love. The Bible says that you get this love in you, in your heart, when you get saved. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God's given to you and given to me whenever I trust Christ. So there's a real love for Jesus Christ. And there's a real love for people and souls. Uh, it's not a self-seeking love. It is a self-sacrificing love. God commended his love toward us. In that demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for those that weren't deserving love. And so it is. It is self-sacrificing love. We ought to love like that. And love others. Well, I wish they'd meet my standard. Then I'd love them. Oh, no, that's not the way you do. That's not love. That doesn't even... You, you, anybody can love people that or like them and love them back and all what about loving somebody who's hard to love like me quit who said amen and Diana said I didn't but I could Shelly Shelly could and she did uh, <laughs> so this love is a supreme love to God it is a self-sacrificing love which shows goodwill to others, right? We saw that love is elite, and then now we're looking at this second major truth. Love has evidences, and we're looking at those evidences in verse 4 through 7. There are 15 of them, and we have covered three of them so far. So we've got the dash. We don't have much time tonight, Brother Steve. Uh, let's take a look and see. Let's verse 4 and 5 go together in uh, verse number 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. And then here's, ver here's the fourth characteristic and fifth characteristic of this God-given love, God-type love, God-love characteristic. It says that uh, it vaunteth not itself. And then the next one goes right with it. And it's not puffed up. Vaunts not itself and is not puffed up. Vaunting itself, that word just simply uh, is the verbal form of pride. It brags and it boasts. 
and then the other just tells you what's in somebody. They're puffed up. It's that word that was used for bellows, the old bellows that we've already talked about. Puffed up. Used six times already in 1 Corinthians. They've got a problem with this. They're swollen up. They're full of themselves. And it comes out in their verbiage. In their talk. They brag. And are boasters and braggers. Uh, so, uh, the root of the problem is this pride thing. They're, they're puffed up. Pride is full of self. Love is full of the Savior. And others. Pride brags about one's own virtues. Corinthians were proud. They are proud about how much they knew. Chapter 8, verse number 1. They, they were. They, look at it. Run, run a couple of verses. Now, touching things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge, what's it do? Tends to puff up. Swell up in you. And create boasting and bragging and charity but charity agape God's love edifies so uh, Corinthians were puffed up swollen with pride about how much they knew about how tolerant they were chapter 5 verse 2 about how superior they were to others look at the fourth chapter verse number 6 it says, uh, and, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. They were thinking they were superior to others. They had this problem. They were puffed up about spiritual leaders that they followed. Oh, I'm of Apostle Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm Simon Peter. See? And there was that kind of puffing up. There was, they were puffed up about spiritual gifts, we're told. They're thinking that they're elite in spirits. God loves us more than he loves everybody else because we've got gifts. <laughs> and they were puffed up about it. So, conceit says I am better than you. Humility says, if I'm better off than you, it's all because of God's mercy to me, not because I deserve it or earn any of it. Right? You, you say, oh, well, he just said in the fourth chapter that they were, they were boasting, they were puffed up. And then the next, very next verse, he says, For who makes you to differ from another? What hast thou that you didn't receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why do you glory or boast? As if thou had not received it. Whatever you've got that's anything good about you is what God gave you. And produced in you. Quit bragging about it. Brag about Him. Love is not big-headed, it's big-hearted. John the Baptist, God's first New Testament prophet. He comes on the scene with God's message and God's power. And then he, when Jesus shows up, he said, He must increase and I must decrease. Listen to this statement that Jesus made in John 12, 49. He said, for I have not, Jesus talking, I have not spoken of myself. <laughs> Can you say that? He, he's talking about, here's the Son of God in His humanity. He said, I've not, I've not spoken about myself. <laughs> Why? Because... 
He's not pride driven. He's talking about the Father. He's talking about the Father's salvation. He's talking about the salvation that the eternal God uh, produced from before the foundation of the world. Pride. Be careful about boasting and bragging and about vaunting yourself and about uh, being puffed up. Uh, when, when I think of a, a, a prime example of uh, puffed up, I think of Muhammad Ali. I've told you this before, used this illustration before. He's on an airplane and the stewardess, that stewardess, she comes up and she says, would you please put your seatbelt on? And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she thought for a second, she said, um, Sir, do you understand that Superman don't need no airplane either? So would you please put your seatbelt on? We, we think we're more than what we are if we don't watch out. Pride. Let me tell you, love is not puffed up. Love doesn't vaunt it itself. And brag and boast about itself. You know, pride gets you in trouble with the Lord. God resists the proud. Gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5. Only by pride cometh contention. It'll get you in trouble with God. It'll get you in trouble with others. It will. So, number six. Love doth not behave itself unseemly. Verse five. Uncomely. Uh, 1828 Webster says lacking grace. Uncomely, unseemly. Uh, uncomely dress, behavior, and manners. Another definition was to fail to keep with accepted standards of what is right in a proper and polite society. Poor manners. Well, that's not love. It's disrespectful to others for you to have poor manners toward people. Being rude to others. Especially non-Christians. I know some preachers that are rude as can be. You, you, they, they almost think they've got a license to be. <laughs> well, I'm a preacher. I'm a man of God. Means I can slap you around spit in your eye. That's almost the attitude. You, you know what? They become stumbling blocks to the unsaved world. They're not stepping stones to God. They're stumbling blocks. They're print and you say, well, could you take some hard preaching? I can take hard preaching and need it. But you know what? When people start questioning your love, it's a problem. It's a problem. So love doth not behave itself unseemly. Then seventh, love seeketh not her own. Love's not only about self, it's about others, their good, their well-being. Uh, I think that he's targeting in particular the gifts again that are taking place in Corinth. And it, they're seeking their own. They're all about themselves. The 14th chapter, verse 4, verse 12, I'll not take time to read it. They're self-centered uh, about... The, and and he, he tells them, he said, do you understand it's not for you? These gifts aren't for you. They're not to promote you. They're not to just build you up. They are about edifying others and the assembly. And if he said, if you can't do that, quit it. That's what the 14th chapter says. Build up others. Are we self-centered? Do we minister to others? I, I read this little piece. A party for I, myself, and me. I gave a little party this afternoon at three. Twas very small. Three guests in all. Just I, 
myself and me. Myself ate up the sandwiches while I drank up the tea. And it was I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. I, myself, and me. <laughs> we, that, you can get like that. Or it's just all, you know, your little circle of you. You made a little circle and it's all about you and it's just going to be about you. So, but love seeketh not her own. Okay. Number eight. Love is not easily provoked. Not easily, quickly uh, provoked and angered. Not quickly angered. We should be angered about sin and Satan and things that uh, are defile us and things that defile others and things that are disobedient to God. But you know what? You can also get to the place that you are provoked about everything all the time. And everybody all the time. And that's not love. Love doesn't want to have to get angry with others. You may have to. But it doesn't want that. It's not quick. It's not easily provoked. Just waiting for it. Knock it off. I got a chip on my shoulder. Just knock it off. Waiting for somebody to knock it off. So, uh, are, are, are we deliberately looking to be angry with others? We need a controlled anger. Far too often it's out of control. Jonathan Edwards, third president of Princeton University, had a daughter, and she had an uncontrollable temper. Well, she was dating a young man, and uh, so the young man came to ask Mr. Edwards for his wife, daughter to wife. Uh, is there any chance that I can marry you? She loves me and I love her. And he said, no, you cannot get married. She, she, you cannot have her. Well, why? We love each other. You can um, ask all you want, but you're not, you're not going to get her. Why? Isn't she a Christian? Well, yeah, she professes to be a Christian. But having said that, she has an uncontrollable temper. And what the God of grace can tolerate, human beings cannot. You cannot have her. You won't be able to take her. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> and I don't think she got married. <laughs> she had such a terrible temper just blow up about everything and always throwing a fit about things <laughs> ah, aren't we having fun not easily provoked number nine love thinketh no evil logizomai thinketh no evil logizomai it's a bookkeeping accounting term we're familiar with it. It's translated other places in our New Testament, impute or impute it. And you know what that means? To put on an account. And the idea of here, of course, is relationships. When we're talking about this love, we're talking about relationships. What, what's happening? All right. I've written it down. I've written it down. And I keep writing it down. And I'm keeping record of all the offenses against me. What a terrible, terrible marriage that would be. Right? Think about it. Constantly bringing up stuff. 
well last week you know what you did last week <laughs> right you know last month and the list is there <coughs> you know what it's been said that good marriages are built on two people who are great forgivers you're living with imperfection and you're going to have to be able to love that one even with its imperfections there are too many people before they get married oh I'll change him girls yeah I've seen it before uh, not generally boys I'll change her no it's usually girls I, I'm, I love him and I'm going to change him and it's going oh yeah and then they wind up getting married and they can't change them it's true I'm, I, I'm not saying they can't pray I'm not saying they can't live a godly example and be influential and all that kind of but I am saying this only God changes the heart and you better make sure that they love God before you go to an altar with them to get married Jesus Simon Peter thought he's big stuff he went to the Lord Jesus he did he always was he, 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 he went to the Lord Jesus he said um, how many times do you forgive people uh, seven times because the rabbi standard was three times. Fe Philip could forgive his wife three times, but she burnt the supper one more time and it's over. We're going to divorce court. It's true. That's first century rabbis. And Simon Peter thought he was tough stuff. Three times the rabbis are telling us, okay, I'll double that and add one. Seven times. Man, that's big. I can forgive somebody seven times. Watch what Jesus, Jesus probably going to pat me on the back and say, you're a spiritual, you're a more spiritual rabbi I've ever thought about being. <laughs> no. Jesus said, uh, Simon Peter, how about forgive him 70 times seven? Let's go with 490. <laughs> See if that'll work out for us. And really what he was saying is, you're to always forgive. Oh no, he did that 491 times. I'm not forgiven now, I don't have to. <laughs> you know, no, no, that's not. He's saying forever, always, continually, repeatedly. Forgive things. Throw it in the trash and go on. Give it to God and go on. Love thinketh no evil. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity. Verse number six, the tenth one. Rejoice not in sin. Why? Because it affects your relationship with God. Not only that, don't rejoice in the sin of others because it, it is damaging and damning to others. So you look at it both ways, your relationship to God, your relationship with others. Don't rejoice in iniquity and sin. That's not love. And yet, sometimes, there's something about the depraved heart that will be happy because somebody fell into sin. Well, I don't like them anyway. I've been praying that they just be exposed for what they are. Is that love? No. Love rejoices not in iniquity. Love is saddened by sin and unrighteousness in others. And in ourselves. 
Why? Because we love God. We don't want that stuff getting in between us and Him. Right? Or us and others. Number 11. Love rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices in God's truth, of course. Because it's what God said. We're hearing what God says. We're loving what God says. We're striving to please God and have good relationship with the Lord. But also, it, I would suggest that it uh, rejoices in honesty with others. Rejoices in truth. Honesty. You know, you can't build a relationship on lies. People deceiving each other and people pretending and people... You, 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 there has to be openness and honesty in relationships. It rejoices in the truth. Do we? Do we rejoice in the truth? Verse number seven. There are four characteristics of love here. Um, I don't know. It's hard to deal with them. Uh, and for me to try to Put them together. This love in us bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, uh, let me tell you what this doesn't mean. Love believes all things. Well, it doesn't mean that I believe the devil's lies. Right? Right? It's not, that's not what it's talking about. I'm to try the spirits. Whoever's preaching, teaching, uh, instructing, I, 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 I'm to evaluate them by the word of God and see, try the spirits whether they be of God. Because a lot of false prophets have gone out in the world. And you have to be careful and keep your eye open. So it doesn't mean that. When it says all things, it, it, it may be... Uh, I don't know. I need to believe all things with a proper Bible boundary about me. Evaluating by the Word. So, look at them. It bears all things. Love bears all things. To cover it uh, Strong's concordance said the word means to cover with silence. Uh, it is comes from a root which is the word roof. A roof. To conceal. I would suggest that it probably means love hides the faults of others. But I do read in my Bible where it says that love covereth a multitude of sins. Right? Puts a roof over it. It caps it. Doesn't get out the loudspeaker and say, Oh, everybody, do you know that Kenny Scott boy? That, that boy has just got that this, did this, and you wouldn't believe that, and something, and that. Listen, everybody, let's pay attention, real close attention to him. No, no. As best as we can, we try to keep things covered. That's what a mother does. Oh, let me tell you all that stuff my daughter does and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. She didn't want all that stuff out. <laughs> right? Because she loves her child. That's the kind of love that is God's love. You say, well, does God display it? Oh, yeah, He's the greatest of forgivers. He, he knows stuff about you and me that He had never told. <laughs> Why? Because He loves us. It bears all things. Puts the blanket over it. 
covers it. First Peter 4, 8 is that passage. But this one's a good one. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covereth all sins. Love. Are we... How do we do? Do we cover sins? Let me tell you this. If you don't have the kind of love you should have, you're happy to tell it on somebody that you don't particularly like. And if you don't watch out, you'll start dragging the dirt out. Love wants to cover. It has redemptive qualities. It's empathetic. It feels the pain of others. Number 13. Love believes all things. I think this has the idea of Love wanting to believe the best about somebody. It isn't always suspecting. Even though there are some conspiracy theorists among us. <laughs> not, e not quick to denounce an offender. Wants to believe the best about something. Not cynical or suspicious about everybody and everything. You know. Believes all things. Not like Job's friends. The gig's up, son. You're the one. God's after you and you deserve it. You're a bad egg. And it's evident. How'd you like to have friends like that? Oh, they love Job. No, they didn't. Not like they should. There must have been a competition against them or something. Because they, they, they're just absolutely rattling all kinds of evil about him. Um... Uh, Hopeth all things. First, the fourteenth. Hopeth all things. Again, that to me is is an optimism. I, I'm trusting God's promise because of God's promise. I've got confidence about the future. But I think the idea is that uh, I can be optimistic about relationships, about others. That's what that's the way God's love thinks. If if Jesus went to Calvary for folks, certainly I could be optimistic about my friend who's presently in a bad situation spiritually speaking. Right? A wife could say, unsaved husband, I, I believe he's going to come. I know it's been decades, but I believe he's going to come. Hopes. All things. Doesn't give up hope. Fifteen. Love endures all things. Love hangs in there. Love hangs in there. It's a military word. It endures uh, in the middle of the battle. It still loves. Love endures all things. Think about it. Stephen has just preached too long a sermon, and he has said too much in his sermon. And so his Jewish opponents determined to throw rocks at him until he lies on the ground 
just about to give up the ghost his last breath. And the battle is real. He's in a fight. The, it's militant. And he still loves. Lord, lay not these sins to their charge. Hateful, bitter hatefulness would have said, Lord, strike that crowd dead and put them in hell quick. Right? Oh no. But here's love. They've absolutely taken his life away. A man that's full of God and just trying to obey God. Lord, please don't lay it to their charge. Sounds like his Savior when he's on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what to do. They're, they're in ignorance. They don't really know what's up. Please bring them to the light of the gospel. Get them in the family so they can be forgiven forever. And saved by your marvelous grace. <laughs> That's love. And let me tell you, it's not human. This is something God has to birth in you. Because natural is retaliate, vengeance, and all. So, what we have here is uh, this chapter is priority. What's most important in the Christian life? What's most important? You, you know we need for the main thing to be the main thing again? We need to major on majors and minor on minors. There, 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 there's a hill to die on. What, what hill is it? Well, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us. It does. Keep the primary primary. Keep the secondary secondary. The Pharisees didn't do like that. You know what they did? They strained at a gnat. Make sure whenever you come in and, and we're going to drink, have supper meal, whenever we pour out the liquid, make sure you strain it because we can't have a gnat. It would violate Old Testament uh, uh, dietary laws make sure you get that gnat out of there because we have got to stay right with God and at the same time Jesus told them he said but you take a camel and you just try to choke it down <coughs> swallow a camel strain it a gnat and swallow a camel Little things you're all wound up about and a camel, something that's just humongous, you just absolutely take it and feed on it, think it's the best thing going. Love majors on majors. And let secondary stuff be secondary. Um, look at verse 13. Last part of the verse. But the greatest of these is love. What's, what's he saying? It's greater than tongues. It's greater than prophecy. It's greater than knowledge. It's more important than faith and hope, we're even told. Uh, it outranks all other virtues. It must be our motive, our attitude, our action. Why, why, why is it so great? Why is it the greatest? Well... Love is the attribute of God that's the attribute of God. 1 John says God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, verse 16. God is love. 
It didn't say God is faith. It didn't say God is hope. It didn't say God is a spiritual gift. God is love. That's why it's the greatest. Because it's the very attribute of God. It's the prominent attribute of God. And then love fulfills the greatest commandment. Love the Lord thy God. They came up and asked the Lord Jesus, what's the greatest? He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. The law is fulfilled in this. It is the greatest commandment. Love is... The first evidence of a work of God in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? Love. 1 John chapter number 3 verse 14 says, and this, 1 John 3 14 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not the brother, his brother abideth in death. There's just something that comes in you that when you get saved, that you love the house of God, the family of God, the people of God. I've gone all these many moons. And, of course, I'm the preacher, so I ought to be here. But the truth of the matter is, you, I, you can't count on a hand how many times I've missed the house of God Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night. In... Uh, 44 years you say you're bragging no I'm just talking to you about God when he saved me put a love in me for God's people and God's work and God's works in and through his church that's right you'll love God's people even though sometimes you hate them it's like a family. You don't divorce your wife just because you hate her. <laughs> or you, uh, just, well, wait a minute. <laughs> just because you had a day where you hated her. <laughs> just because you fell out today. <laughs> you stay with her and stick it out and you finally forgive and you get over it and you go on. <laughs> 490. So, yeah. That was a... 491, you're done. <laughs> so it's evidence of God's work in your life. And, um, and then we're told that it, that it goes on. It, 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 it lasts, love goes on. It goes on, it goes on. What, after this life, you go, you know what? Faith's going to become sight compared to faith and hope. Well, hope, I'm expecting in the future. Oh, no, well, the future's here when you get to heaven. But love's going to be there. Unbelievable love for eternity. It abideth. It fails not. It said these gifts are going to fail, but he said this isn't going to fail. This is going to continue and continue and continue and continue. So, uh, we need to get done, don't we? Don't say amen. L look here. Um, that we need to spend time in prayer asking God to give us more love. We need to confess the sin of unlove and unconcern for others. And then we need to acknowledge that it's a command of God. Look at the 14th chapter, verse number 1, 1 Corinthians. Follow after charity ensue is translated another place in our New Testament pursue this God kind of love in your life in relationships relationship with God with your relationship to others pursue it it's a present imperative which is imperative. It's a command. 
God commands it. Follow after this love. Pursue after this love. Strive to have this love in your life. Continually. There's our problem. We sort of roller coaster, don't we? Oh man, I'm loving like I'm supposed to love. And then tomorrow I bought them out and can't hardly muster it up. Amen or oh me. Oh me. It's a command of God. Realize it's a command. Realize you have the power. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given to you. You've got the power. You've got it. Ask for it. Lord, I can't, I can't get, I can't get it uh, built up in me. Will you do something to build it in me? Create it in me. It's normal for the Christian life, 1 John 4, 7. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 22. So, be committed to love. Realize you're able to love. Realize it is natural for the child of God to love. And then realize that you need it and ask God to do it and help you to be a person that loves God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and others. Oh, yeah. Corinthian church, they've got a lot of ideas about what church life is and what church Christianity is. And a lot of them are wrong. And Paul just drops this 13th chapter right in the middle of all of it. And he said, um, let's get back to what's important. Let's stand.
Larry Steinbaker dismisses, please.